Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Perspectives. I am going to be your host today. I am Sharon Remy Pearson. And today we're going to be chatting with ex former Olympian Lisa Forrest, who's written a wonderful book called Glide. I hope you've had a chance to read it. So uh, you may remember the Moscow Olympics in 1980 were ground to a halt or had so much controversy um, because it was the Olympics that the politicians wanted to boycott. And Lisa swam at the Moscow Olympics and subsequent to that in the Commonwealth Games here in Brisbane in Australia. She became a household name because of that. She, in, she was 14 years old when she did her first Commonwealth Games. What a remarkable human being. She was captain of the Moscow Olympic team, a small band of athletes that went in the face of death threats, controversy, news headlines, going either way, slamming them or supporting and celebrating them. Uh, her family was receiving death threats during this time. And after that, as I mentioned, in I think it was 1982, she swam and won gold, two gold medals in the Brisbane Commonwealth Games with the home crowd just going crazy for her. After her retirement from swimming at the ripe old age of, I think, 19, she went on and had an amazing career as a journalist. She was on the midday show, I think it was, with Ray Martin. Uh, Saturday afternoon football, she had her own shows. She went on to uh, a show called Everybody on the ABC TV and some other shows as well. She also trained as an actor in New York. But all the way through this, there was another narrative going on. So the external looks amazing and shiny and filled with success and applause and gold medals and under the water there was so much more going on I mean that metaphorically within Lisa and so in Lisa's book Glide uh, she talks about the challenges she was facing going on within her within facing her emotions um, what it meant to be mentally tough as a 14 or a 16 year old not wanting to feel that tough she talks in Glide about how to be mindful and filled with compassion when it seems everything around you, all the stimuli coming your way is telling you to be any other way. And now she works as a mindfulness coach and a mindfulness trainer, teaching the principles of compassion and mindfulness as she describes its two wings of this beautiful bird and how to navigate life in a way other than being a perfectionist, other than being tough other than never facing our vulnerability and seeing his weakness she paints a very different landscape about how we can be and how we can navigate the beauty and the joy of life and her message is very inspiring i must say reading the book there were times i was thinking when when this hero being lisa find within her that it was always within her and i won't give you the punchline but the episodes worth hearing about how she transformed her internal dialogue, her internal narrative, so that she felt as beautiful on the inside as her life looked on the outside. And here she is, Lisa Forrest. So where are you? Are you in Sydney? Yes, I'm in Sydney, yeah. Um, yeah. We live in the inner city in Redfern, so we've been here for, oh, more than 20 years. So yes, <laughs> you could buy a place under half a million in Redfern back in the day you when really? we bought. We did back then, not oh, now, of course. Not so. now. I've been <laughs> so, but I grew, up in the, I grew up in the northern beaches of Sydney, but my mum um, grew up in the inner city. So my Nana was living here all her life. So we were, we went between the two all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Great stories from Sydney. I felt, I don't know Sydney really, except as a tourist. So you introduced Sydney and there was a lot of a lot more heart to it the way you wrote about it than I've imagined it to be, which was beautiful. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Do you mean in terms of the DY ladies? I and do. Sort of growing up by the beach, yeah. yeah. I was very lucky. I mean, yes. it, it is a charmed, you know, way to grow up. And I was just yeah. lucky, like Dad was a Bondi lifesaver. And then at, then at a certain point he decided that he'd rather, rather board ride um, or ride a board. And so, yeah, he, they had a place at, at Newport, um, before long before I was born and back yeah. then there was no sewage or anything it was just a holiday place so mum and dad would drive the caravan up there for this block of land <laughs> and then once they decided to get married and have kids they moved sort of back towards Chroma where there was a school and a bus route and yeah. you know all that sort of stuff yeah I feel in some ways you saw you your parents were sung heroes in your book yeah. but I think even more so they were an unsung hero a theme in the book was their heroism in how they were just so uh self-sacrificing and placing you center in your dream center to their worlds. I thought that was beautiful the way they've done that. And my hat goes off to them, that kind of parenting. 
it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, we talk about helicopter parenting now. Yes. And yet um, they were, I mean, you use the word self-sacrificing. They just, I mean, certainly for dad, um, I think we were his world. Like my, my yes. dad was a shy kind of, you know, he was really happy in his own world. He's a surfer. He was a swimmer. He didn't really need a lot and loved where he grew up and obviously loved mom. And then we came along and he was, he worked on building sites and we just were, you know, we were his world and we still are really like, you know, he will say, yeah. if I go to visit him, he'll be like, you know, see you next week. And he'll say, it can't come soon enough, love. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, they weren't helicopter parents. It no. was just more, if I was interested in swimming, which, you know, I showed an interest from that first um, day down at the DY ladies, then, you know, he'd help me do it. And likewise, um, you know, if, if I wanted to, whatever it was in terms of um, training, he would get me there. A mum and dad, obviously mum was at home, you know, covering the other side of things while dad was mm. taking me to places. Mm. And, um, and yet at the same time, I mean, um, just before the Commonwealth Games in, um, in Edmonton, that first Commonwealth Games, before those trials, I was really like exhausted this one particular night. We were training very hard. We, we trained back then in the way that no athlete would no. train now. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but I said to him, I got out of the pool and I was in tears. I'd been in tears in training because I felt I wasn't, you know, meeting the mark. And I got into the car. I said, I'm retired. It's not worth it. This, yeah. is, this is no fun. And yeah. he dropped me at home. I went up into the house to yeah. have dinner and he worked, turned around and went back to the coach and said, she's giving up. There was no trying to talk me into it. It was just, no. okay. And even as, you know, like I kind of leapfrogged my parents in terms of experience once I was traveling, you know, I was on the other side of the world from 14 for mm. nearly three months. Yeah. Um, and they were back here all the time. And so it got to the point, even in my teenage years where I'd say, you know, ask dad a question, he'd say, I don't know, love, whatever you think, you know, he wasn't, yeah. he, he just was, he was like, I don't know, you know, I'll help, I'll support you, but I don't know what the right thing to do is. So I remember, I think of that a lot in terms of raising my own son, you know, yeah. it's, um, I've just, uh, he's in Canberra, he's just moved to the ANU. Yeah. And um, I certainly missed my parents a lot. So I said to him, we'll come down as often as you need us. There'll be a point where you don't need us. And that's when, you know, it's, you tell us and, and we'll be around as much as you need us. So it's that kind of, I think that that's the sort of stuff that I got from mum and dad, that sort of give them roots and wings, roots and wings. That's what we've got to give roots them. Roots and wings. I think we should talk about that when we get a little bit into your story about yeah. what you've got right. to say about parenting, because you touched yeah. on it in, in Glide and I really enjoyed that. There was a little pieces of narrative. I thought you want to go further there. That's the next book. <laughs> well, it's funny because I've talked a lot. I mean, now I'm the adult, I'm a parent of an adult, right? And yes. he's 18, he's in Canberra. And I've often, it is something that's always fascinated me. I, I've watched people in my time, I just friends and stuff like how, who are the people who really get on well with their parents and what is it about both the parenting and, and them, I guess, that, mm. that makes them want to be or gives, helps to balance that relationship. And I've sort of talked about it and friends keep saying, you've got to write about that. You've got to write about yes. that because everybody is having that challenge. It seems yes. Like. Oh, yes. I've heard some stories. So Lisa, let's do the formal part. You're right. extraordinary. <laughs> you have an extraordinary um, CV that for anybody who is, doesn't know you is worth chatting about. So congratulations on your successes. And oh. I hope, I trust, I'm sure you look back with a feeling of, even though we're going to talk about some of the other stuff that's come up for you as a result of it, you must look back with a sense of, I did that. I did that at 14. That was me. I, I'm remembering me at 14. <laughs> Kudos to you. <laughs> I know it's some, it's one of those things that it hits you at different times. Okay. You know, um, when I wrote my first book, making the most of it, um, yeah. it was, you know, in the lead up to the Olympic games in Sydney. Yeah. And um, until that point, I'd been running hard from that sort of swimming yes. career, trying to prove that I was something else. Yeah. And so suddenly in this lead up to Sydney, I had a whole lot of friends. I lived in the inner city, nothing to do with my sport life at all, yeah. quite deliberately. So, you know, I'd, I'd done that. And they were all saying to me as in the lead up to Sydney, you went through all this at 16? And yes. at that point I was like, yeah, well, yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and even, you know, the, I mean, mum and dad, they were, um, because the boy, you know, the Olympic Games, my Olympic Games was boycotted or the attempt yeah. to boycott. There was a whole lot of drama around it. So that idea of kind of being even the parents of an Olympian was very mm. different back then. So mum and dad stayed in a hotel um, for four days. I think mum had found, you know, some hotel for them while they were going to the Olympics. And so there are visitors, you know, there and they were, when they finally chatted at breakfast and they said, oh yeah, our daughter was an Olympian. Oh, 
your daughter's an Olympian. So even they got to feel yeah. this sort of pride of that. But yes. yeah, different times things things will pop up and I'll say, oh yeah, you know, such and such, I'll tell a story. And <laughs> my friend's like, <laughs> really? Oh, or oh, something else you've done. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's let's, very nice, yeah. So let's start back. You, you became a champion swimmer at the age of 14. I'm trying to remember me at 14 and what I thought was a big deal. And can you paint a picture, if you can recall, what was in you to be that disciplined? So I think Edmonton was your first, first Commonwealth in Games. 1978, yeah. the first Commonwealth Games that you, rep right. you represented Australia. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> and you had a silver medal in, the two, in backstroke. That was, I think, tended to be your specialty. Yeah, 200. Can you introduce us to how... You could be, I, I don't want to use the word discipline because I don't want to put words in your mouth. What it was that led you to be able to achieve that? That's as vague as I can make it to let you fill in the space for us. Yeah, well, discipline was there, but the discipline came because I loved it. I loved yeah. to swim. And I was very lucky in that um, when I was, you know, about, about to turn eight, my brother decided that he wanted a fiberglass surfboard. My dad had been an old Bondi lifesaver. You know, we used foam cool light surfboards back then in, in between yeah. the flags. And dad said, you have to be able to swim 400 metres before you can get a fibreglass board. <laughs> wow. So he began his campaign down at the DY Men's Club. Um, I yeah. lived on the northern beaches of Sydney. Um, um, and the, the neighbours took him down there. They were members. And so he went down, he got his name in the paper, you know, in the results <laughs> section of the Manly Daily. And so I decided I'd, I love to swim and I'd learned to swim, you know, sort of before him. I was the older sister. So I guess mm. there was some pride. Um, and so I headed down there, you know, from um, the next week. Um, but true to form, I was a bit of a crier. I was quite shy. Mm. Um, and so the moment that I burst into tears, you know, on the blocks before my first race, 25 metres, it looked a lot further away than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, the DY ladies had a policy. They didn't let little girls walk away, um, yeah. you know, crying, fearing that they might not be able to do it. So they put wow. a, an older girl jumped in the water immediately and said, come on, sweetheart, you could do this. Aww. And so she walked, you know, the gun went off. I threw myself in and she walked backwards mm. all the way down the pool to get me to that 25 metre line, always encouraging, you know, come on, yeah. sweetheart, come on, sweetheart. Yeah. And of course, by the time I got there, well, you know, I, I cried all the way, although ladies told me that, you know, they love to tell the story that in her first race at the DY ladies, Lisa Forrest cried all the way to the finishing line. <laughs> but I forgot that, you know, once yeah. I got there. And so I was down there the next week and it, I was just, you know, obviously there was some talent there, but um, my, mm. you know, it moved really quickly. I, I sort of almost won um, the under eight, 25 metres of butterfly a couple of weeks later in the first, mm. in that first, in that first couple of months I taught myself to do butterfly from Shane Gould's book swimming the Shane Gould way yeah. um, I broke a state record at 10 I you know won cha state championships at that age so I was at my first nationals at, at 10 I went to get experience so I just loved wow. it and I I love the training and I think swimming is a beautiful sport for shy people because hmm. you don't have to be a member of a team you know you can sort of talk to people in your own time and hmm. so I was the oldest in my home and but it the pool I had older brother big brothers you know and they were mm. lovely and I just I loved it so yes there was discipline but you know even I think um um you know grit has been defined as sort of passion first and mm. then perseverance and so mm. I really was just lucky that I found the love of this beautiful sport. Was it also that you were validated by people I think at that young age to have something where you are validated regardless of how you perform is a very nurturing experience Oh, I think and we don't all this, have totally like yeah. you cannot separate the two um that first race so by the rule of the DY ladies was that you had to swim three club races to enter a championship race mm. and um so the first championship race as long as I swam the club race on the third day I could enter the under 825 meters of butterfly and um and the and so I nearly, I nearly won it. I came second to a girl called Jenny Horner and her older sisters were in the club. Her mum was yeah. the secretary. They were DY lady stalwarts yes. and I came from nowhere. Yeah. And so this was a big deal. Yeah. Like this, I remember still the, the, the <laughs> you know, the, 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 not friction, it was the wrong word, the excitement that it caused. Yeah. And yeah. Mrs. Y, who was the president, you know, suddenly people were telling me where I could go to stroke correction classes in the winter and learn to put my face in the water doing freestyle because I was an under, you know, was, nobody taught you big arms and no. bilateral breathing back then. Um, and so suddenly I had done something that was impressive. Um, mm. And so, yes, that definitely comes with it. And I was also very lucky because I had really gentle 
kind of mm. older coaches and mm. they were very nurturing. I didn't ever have anybody who yelled at me or no. who, who kind of talked about being tough. I never heard the word, you know, no. later on, we'll get to that when the going yeah, gets tough, the tough get going, yeah. which I loved. But back then it was just, and I think I trained hard and I liked it. So there was never any need to yell at me, but I didn't ever have coaches that were just sort of ridiculous for a young person, you know, mm. <laughs> what I would call ridiculous. So I had nurturing people. So I think you have a gentle spirit. And so that was nurtured when you were younger. So that gentleness was able to survive mm. perhaps longer than it does for some other people who don't have that same nurturing kind of mentoring. Yeah. Well, why would you persist if you were in a program that, um, you know, belittled you or somehow yeah. made you feel that you weren't enough or, you know, that sort of whole idea that if you don't show any en encouragement, then, you know, they'll want to try harder for you, you know, that kind of. Well, I've of seen film footage of that stuff. happening with gymnasts. Oh, children. only listening to all the stories now of the gymnasts. Yeah. But, but likewise, you can find it in swimming. You can find it you yeah. know, in all sorts of places. Um, well, you did so. find it at Edmonton. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, even then, you know, I mean, I think that, um, I swam for Australia at a time that was very stressful and people were under, you know, coaches were under a lot of stress. The whole world had moved on and we were still using, you know, techniques from the 1950s. Although I was lucky at home, I had a home coach that wasn't, mm. he was using the more modern techniques. And so mm. was Tracy Wickham. So we had the answers and we just didn't have, you know, it was a, a really great learning experience as a teenager because you're watching adults. There is an obvious way that we have to go and the adults are not a lot of the adults aren't going that way so what makes you an adult that doesn't want to change I think as a young person I even then I was like I'm not going to be an adult who won't change who won't adapt and so yes I, again there was some stuff going on some really tough coaching well let's talk about that so people who don't yeah, know we'll the story yeah. so you went to Edmonton you were on the team you were 14 years old mm -hmm. you'd had this nurturing mentoring until yeah. then uh, and only encouragement and positive positivity and do what you want to do and everything that's meant to happen for a young child. Yeah. And then you had to go away for a month's training. A month's training camp in Honolulu, yeah. In Honolulu. At a time, in the post-1976, post when we hadn't won a yeah. gold medal for the first time in four decades at the Olympic Games. Yes. And the girls in the pool got the blame, really. It wasn't the, the old coaching scene methods. in Glide that you talk about um, so that for the viewers meeting. who don't know, the book we're talking about is Glide by Lisa Forrest. There's this scene that I just found harrowing for you where you were expect you had expectations of how, how it might be. You'd never done it before. The accommodation was lousy. You were treated literally like you weren't first class or worth championing and bringing out your best. It was immediately you felt, must have felt like an afterthought in the whole thing, that you weren't even there to be you and swim for you. You were there to reclaim and redeem them it felt like you were there for their redemption because for those who don't know lisa and the other sw late women swimmers the girls walked mm. in and began to be berated about what would happen and how they'd be sent home and what was the list of possible like transactions you'd be sent home if you didn't train hard enough if you missed yep. a session uh, if the girls put on weight yeah um and we weren't allowed to eat desserts because essentially the you know the australian girls that didn't win in in um montreal even though they were racing east germans who <laughs> were drug takers yeah that they had failed because they were undisciplined and overweight and and so it set up immediately that sort of fear of, um, particularly for a good girl who, you know, wants to please everybody, yeah. um, that kind of fear of, oh, my God, what might happen? So, yeah, in the first week, because um, we were in the dorms in Hawaii at the, at the University of Hawaii, and so I'd never even eaten in cafeterias. And I'd had, you know, at home just eaten a couple of, you know, meat of some sort, good meat and three veg. And I went into a cafeteria where, you know, worried about putting on weight, like what there was only mince or you know, kind of things, creamy sort of sauces in pastas. And so for the first week, um, I only ate salads because I was yeah. so scared of putting on weight. And at the same time, I was with Joe King. Now, Mr. King, you know, has passed away. But it's not to say that he wasn't gentle. He wasn't nurturing because he was lovely and he did really like mm. me. I felt liked. But he was old school. So mm. we got there on the Monday. I started at six kilometer sessions by I had beautifully tailored five kilometer sessions at home, all tailored around swimming 200 backstroke, did most of my sessions in backstroke. By the end of that first week, we were swimming eight and nine kilometers per session twice a day. And I was eating salads. No. So I dropped half a stone the first week. Yeah. And so suddenly then we're like, oh, we need to look after her. She's, you know, she's doing, she's, uh, she's, 
we, uh, you know, she's somehow not, she is not coping. So, but in that way, it was more kind of eating. I didn't dare tell anybody. You were 14. That I was or, yeah. You were but, I mean, 14 so I, years old. I was 14, but there were 15 year olds, there were 16 year olds. And that's how it was back then. Yes. And I think until, it is like interesting listening to any, many of the girls now talk, whether it's just the girls in a workplace or the girls in, um, you know, in sport, the gymnasts and things like that, we just accepted it as what you needed to do if you were going to swim for Australia. And I, I knew, when there was a, I tell the other story of Deborah Foster who won the 100 backstroke. Um, I won the 100 and 200 backstroke to make the team. But with that training, by the third week, I was visiting a, neuro, a neurologist in the hospital because I had these mm. shooting yeah. headaches. And I mean, now you'd probably call them migraines, but yeah. there were three attacks in the pool. I had no idea what was happening to me. Yeah. And so I didn't smoke my best. But all the time, Deb was in that water, in that pool saying, no, no, Mr. King, no, I'm not doing that. Or she'd yes. do go slows if she wasn't allowed out. So she was that little bit older and she was just used to yeah. questioning an adult, which I had never learned to do. And no. you know, eventually that was certainly the way that I parented my son to question adults being yeah. polite but you are allowed to question yeah. um so that was something I had to learn to do and she won that 100 backstroke she was always in once we got to Edmonton she won the um, Commonwealth Games race so I was like right there's a difference between the way I'm approaching mm. this and the way she's doing it and she's doing what she needs to win because mm. for all of the stuff about not training hard or mm. not being disciplined or questioning she did the job she was sent to do and yeah. I was like I need to be like her <laughs> mm. And so we're clear, there was no lack of discipline or training hard on anybody's behalf. Everyone was so desperate to make Australia proud, make their families of proud. Course. They, you're they're so young, you bring so much to it. You're there to do your best. Yeah. You're not yeah. there to goof off. You didn't work all these years as a child to fly all that way to goof off. The mentality well, to me is mind blowing. Yeah, and that that was part of the mentality that a lot of the, the 76 girls had were over the hill. I mean, back then over the hill was 16. You didn't swim yeah. through till, you know, there was, how were you going to swim in the amateur days and support yourself unless you were from a wealthy family or you went to the university, universities in America. Okay. So even though we were understanding that, that, that 16 wasn't the peak age, there was this feeling that the girls had gone to Montreal because they were over the hill and they'd just gone for the trip. So that fear of just going for the trip also was, that kind of came in later on for me of not wanting to be like that, but it's the, hardly you know, a junket. You weren't even allowed to leave the <laughs> training area. <laughs> I know, I know. It was, you know, and, and you tell people that now, kids now, the sport, the athletes now yeah. are just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I talked at schools once my first book came out, I'd tell these yeah. stories and you'd have, at first I thought the, and I was talking to your nines and yeah. um, I'd say to the teachers, are they bored? They must be bored because they were not responding at all. And yeah. they're like, they're not bored. They're hanging on every word. They can't, they can't you're, you're describing it. Dickinsonian <laughs> times as you were back in the dark ages. Exactly. And these were the amateur days. And yet mm. sometimes I think, wow, there were some advantages to that in the sense that you did have to swim while you're young and then you mm. got on with life. There wasn't this, oh, how long can my career, you know, keep okay. going for? Um, so when I finished at 19, lots of my friends were, you know, just at university and just kind of new. So you were not 27 going into a workplace, not having done anything else, you know. Yes. That, so there were some advantages to it. And I think sometimes also just mm. the advantage that you start from love. Yes. I started from love. There was nothing in it for me or for mum and dad. So I wonder sometimes with, oh, you know, with parenting, whether the there's lack so of much it. In it, more in it for the parents. Too. And also the lack of endorsements back then would have meant there was oh, a yeah. lot, lack of social media. A lot. Le I mean, we, we've just described awful in terms of those four weeks, but a lot of your space and your mind was yours. You didn't have yeah. social media. You had oh. press headlines, but they're only once a day. Social media is this relentless mill of 24 hours a day having opinions on people's lives that we yeah. don't know. You don't. You didn't have any of that. I think about them today to be that age in the face of social media endorsement yeah. deals, not wanting to let anybody down. I would have been incapable at 14 of having mm. the maturity and the responsibility to understand mm. what I was undertaking. Mm. I mm. Social media would have defeated me to mm. be in your position and deal with social media, especially with Moscow Olympics, which we're about to mm. go to. Mm. Just the relentless nature of the hate messages and the judgments. It's just excruciating for a child. Yeah, uh, and it, and 
that because I had that time, what we did was, you know, I wrote a lot of letters and really yeah. that was the beginning of me feeling that I, or knowing that I could write because I often yeah. get so many compliments about the letters that I wrote and in many ways that helped my, um, I, I wrote because it helped my homesickness. So if somebody yeah. sent me even a card, they'd get a long letter <laughs> <laughs> because it just soothed, it was soothing for me. So later yes. on, you know, when I was able to tell stories uh, or feel as though I could write, um, it came from that because people would say, I love your letters. You know, you talk, mm. you write like you talk or you yeah. tell a great story. So that also came out of it. And I think also the, the um, for me, just you are able to sort out a lot of emotions when you put mm. it down on paper. And even now I was, I was at a dinner last week and there's some, uh, there were um, families or parents there whose kids were going to, in Melbourne, there are a couple of, I guess they're private schools where the kids go in year nine and they don't actually have any contact. They have mm. to write letters and stuff. They take all the phones mm. and everything away. And mm. I think it's a really wise thing, you know. Yes. A, a, yeah. I, I don't know how they manage with no. social media these days, the kids. You'd have to have really be really strong in putting it away or not having a phone. <laughs> yeah, well, they consider it more addictive than crack cocaine to a child's yeah. brain. That's yeah, I know. How, how does any child have the conscious living ability the what we spend a lifetime learning <laughs> they've got to have a child and also represent australia i just yeah who's who yeah. signs up for that now you then yeah. went to <laughs> moscow congratulations i had i was around then and i remember it i remember some of the headlines i can't even imagine what it was like for you so you so again if you could set the scene for somebody who's perhaps not familiar with what, what happened with anything but an ordinary olympic games yeah, sure. And I mean, that was a lot when I wrote my book, Boycott, which was my yes. first nonfiction book about the Olympics. Uh, you are not alone in that people would come up to me yeah. after and say, well, I was around, but I don't know what I was doing. I just don't remember it being like that. No. Um, and so essentially the Soviets invaded Afghanistan in the end of 1979. Mm -hmm. um, within the first weeks of January, the, um, the president of the United States, Jimmy Carter, had called for a boycott. And Malcolm Fraser, our Prime Minister, along with Margaret Thatcher and a whole lot of other Prime Ministers yep. said, yeah, we think that's a, a great idea. Um, we'll, we'll go along with that. However, Malcolm Fraser wasn't willing to make that decision himself. And likewise, huh. um, Margaret Thatcher, the British um, Olympic Committee said very early on, they were one of the first in March, we're going. You know, Mrs Thatcher might know a lot about politics, but she doesn't know anything about the Olympics. So mm. get lost, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> but we yeah. were much kind, gentle or not quite as willing to um, go against the government. Our Olympic Federation took quite a while so it wasn't until May the 23rd that those 11 men met and voted 6-5 that we would go mm. um, and during that whole period so at first I hadn't the first like in the first couple of months the uh, trials were in March so it was really just no point worrying about something until you actually make the team <laughs> yeah and then once I made the team in March and I was also named captain of that team you were. in year 11 so suddenly it was not, um, you know, how will you go, but why should you go? So you're talking to the media. Here I am, the 16-year-old, getting a very fast lesson on you know, geopolitics and what, where Afghanistan is, for God's sake. Um, and also just, you know, explaining to the, you know, the community why we should go and why I should fulfill my little dream when the world was trying to fight communism. Um, and, you know, you could, as I tell the kids, you could swap communism for terrorism. The communists yeah. were coming to take away our way of life. And, yeah. um, and that, you know, that's how we prepared, really. And so it was a matter of just, you know, training um, for this event that you hope that you would get to. Um, I'd be at home doing an English, um, you know, assignment. I get a phone call. You know, it was, it was a person from the, it was a journalist, you know, Neville Rand's just put in $100,000 to the, you know, Olympic campaign because all the sponsors were dropping out. So, oh, you know, wow. And how do you feel? So I'd give my, you know, feeling of that. Somebody was supporting us. Great. Yay. Go back to my English um, assignment. But also within the, that sort of first week, really, of being made captain, we then started getting, you know, death threats. So we had a whistle mm. by the telephone. That's what the police um, recommended mm. that we do. So at least we could blow the whistle really loudly when one mm. of these calls came. And I think sometimes, even with social media, like at least when you had a phone call, yeah. you had a whistle, yes. you felt you had agency. Yeah. I could do something, you yes. know. Whereas with the social media stuff, you're just bombarded with it. If you, with the relentless the nature of it. Yeah. So we were lucky in that sense. But again, it was my parents were just very, they're just yes. very common sense people. Like, well, I was allowed to go to the footy and I was, I'd go to training and I'd go to the, uh, to the movies with friends. And eventually 
it was in that period where we first started going to see bands. You know, back in those days, you didn't have to, you could sort of, the bouncer let you in. The best local bands park, then, back then. Then you could get the in. Best bands. <laughs> best days. Oh. So Australian Crawl and Split Ends and oh, all of those remember. bands kept insane. Yep. And, then, and then we got on the, eventually got on the, on the um, plane to go on the 1st of July. But it took, it was the 23rd of May and then, um, and then there was another meeting. The AOF agreed to one more meeting with the Prime Minister and he tried to convince them again. And then they voted again. I think the vote was even less. It was more like 7-3. Seven, seven, so so the, the AOF was really, the members of the Olympic Committee were pretty angry by that point that Fraser kept pressuring them when he'd said mm. that um, he wouldn't. Mm. Well, and also, of course, the government was giving money to sports and to individuals to withdraw. Never given government money before wow. to athletes. And so the first time that the Australian government ever gave money to Olympic athletes was to withdraw from the Olympic Games. It was crazy. It was a crazy time. It made sense at the time. I don't, I wasn't, I was your age, exactly your age. And I never questioned the media, Lisa. I just read the headlines and read the articles and believed it all. So whatever yeah. the media was saying, I didn't, it never occurred to me to question the message the way we can yeah. today and the way we do. Well, I think that was, I think it was probably part of the times and you are, I guess, um, you, you know, you talked about sort of being young, but you uh, become mat mature in ways that, yeah, um, you know, some ways and not in others. So yeah. sort of emotional maturity and maybe going out with boys and all that stuff. I wasn't so um, mature mm. in that way, the normal things that people were doing at that age. But then in other ways you were. So you were part of, you know, a history of athletes. I knew about athletes that had protested things like, um, you know, the say the, the Springbok tour and stuff like that. So yeah. there had been protests and, of course, there were older athletes around that I was following that I, you know, I, re I respected older, particularly, um, you know, the Chris Wardlaws. There were older guys on our swimming team. They were very active. Mark Tonelli was very active. So I wanted to be, you know, I, I was prepared to do whatever we had to do to get there. Also, I mean, I came from a Labor voting family. So that was much easier. It was pretty much split down liberal labor lines. You didn't have a lot of independence back in those days. So, mm. you know, there were people who believed mm. that you did what the government told you to do. And yet, yes. of course, if you were at a Labor government, <clears throat> Labor voting family, Malcolm Fraser had sacked Gough Whitlam. So the outrage that then he should be trying to stop their daughter going to the Olympic Games, yes. was, that was fueled in there. So there was no question that I was going to be supported to go. But for a lot of athletes who lived in yeah. liberal voting households, it was very stressful. And I know with the rowers, even though the rowing body themselves were furious, they were traditionally conservative, but furious that the government should think they had a say when they didn't contribute to anything. So in sports like that, they would take the athletes out of their homes and put them in camp to keep them um, safe, not safe from their own families, but to at least protect their decision to go, if you like. Wow, yeah. that's a lot to put on kids. That is a Very lot. Very interesting, yeah. I yeah. don't know how you had the ability. Did you have any media training? The ability to take no. a phone call? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're sitting around the table. What do you think I should say, Mum? <laughs> or, you know, you kind of work it out. Although not not really. Like I was, I don't think that I said a whole lot. I don't think I was all that um, bullshit. Um, I just, I, like I look at the girls today and yeah. well, just even the, you know, the kids that are protesting the climate, um, climate change yeah. and they're so um, beautiful and they're so well-spoken and they can debate really well. I don't think I was that sort of kid. I was, yeah. we didn't have that sort of training. It was like, no, nah, well, I think we should go because, you know, it's not really fair and you yeah. know, we're still, we're still <laughs> trading wool and wheat and we knew that kind of stuff. So we were yeah. still trading with these people. So yeah. why shouldn't the athletes go? And, yeah. you know, the sport is about bridging gaps Mm. Um, and so we were true to the Olympic ideal of meeting, mm. you know, meeting everybody and treating one another, you know, mm. with the same amount of respect. And of course you did, you know, you met a communist and, you know, he was handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we were out in the world, you know, it's in a different yeah. way to others. So oh, in just that amazing way, story. What an experience for you. Yeah. Do you look back on that time and how do you reflect on that time today? just lucky you know yeah I think particularly when I was writing boycott I thought how incredible to be able to go through that experience mm. and then be able to write about it yeah um I mean I felt that there was quite a lot of responsibility to tell the mm. stories that mm. nobody a lot of people had not heard you know the I story agree. of the women's hockey team that were yeah. there was the first time hockey was going to be in women's at the Olympic yeah. Games and they'd been promised by their association that if the AOF voted for them to go 
yeah. then they would go. And the AOF voted on Friday that we'd go. And on Monday, you know, they read in the newspaper that in the interests of Australian hockey, they'd been withdrawn. Oh, but by the way, we, you know, we're going to send you off to a, another inter another international meet. Like, who'd want to go to another international meet, yeah. you know, rather than the Olympics? So for those girls, and some of the stories of the intimidation that yeah. people experienced at work, um, mm. you know, in the homes, that was that was mm. so interesting. So I felt um, very lucky, and of course, like back then, I can still feel if I tell the story of we were in training camp in France for a week, and then we flew into Moscow. Mm. And I still, I get goosebumps now just thinking about it. The moment that the plane began its descent into Moscow and you're going behind the Iron Curtain yeah. and, you know, it's Robert Ludlum sort of territory. I was yes. a big reader and so I'm suddenly, Same. you know, you're in this, this yeah. incredible world. So um, uh, that was, you know, the experience of going to Moscow back then when nobody did. It was so mm. rare to go behind yes. the Iron Curtain and then you're at some Basils and the Kremlin and oh, it was it was extraordinary. Wow. I also feel for the athletes who couldn't go because you have a short shelf life back then. You've peaked after four years of training to qualify and get to Olympic Games. You maybe don't have another game in you. All your life for these kids, some of them, has been spent building up to that year. It was 1980. That's when I'm going to peak. Everything I've done for the last four years is for this week. And then they couldn't go. Yeah. And then the very thought of can I, like in, for gymnasts, can I be good enough in another four years? Yeah. That's questionable. Can I maintain this regime for another? That's eight years yeah. of devotion to get to qualify simply because this game's meant you couldn't go. I can't even imagine some, some people, how they're looking back now with a feeling yeah. of loss or maybe regret. And they've yeah. had to do so much in their minds to soften the burden of regret that must be in them. Yeah. Oh, I, I, look, I mean, and, you know, as we'll talk about, there's, there's what's going on outside and there's what's going on inside. Yeah. You know? And, and I know people called me afterwards, um, one swimmer who um, she withdrew but didn't realise that you could get any money. So it wasn't as though she was just felt as though she couldn't do it. And yeah. she she chatted to me for the book and then she called me when the book came out. She said, Lisa, I, I thought it'd be okay. And she said, I picked it up. I went, I bought it in the bookshop mm. and then I, I started reading it when I was still in the in the shopping oh, centre. Wow. And she said, I just had to stop and sit down mm. and just cried. You know, we... Yeah hold on to all sorts of things and we yeah. don't realize yes um, but oh yeah the stories of girls who yeah the hockey cup you know one of the hockey players I spoke to she thought she'd get she was six she wasn't much older than me thought she'd get to the next games and then yeah. wasn't selected oh, for 84 yes. um and oh, just those stories and even you know the stories the different athletes the pressure they were under at home mm. um it was it and and of course there was no sports psychology then so no. it was this thing that people went through and you didn't talk about it no because the 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 the, the um, sports bodies certainly didn't want to think about it. Like even no. when I wrote that book in two thousand and seven, I spoke to John Coates and he spoke to Gough Whitlam. He decided that um, he wouldn't show the minutes of the meeting back in nineteen eighty of the, the the Greater AF. So it was the bigger. It was the whole Olympic movement that was meeting. I think in April it was the annual general meeting. That's right. And they were going to vote then, and they didn't. And so they held, um, Sid Grange held an in-camera meeting so that people could speak freely. And I wanted to see those notes. But he spoke to Goff, or John Coates spoke to Goff, and Goff said it should wait 30 years um, because there would be people embarrassed, oh. in sport today, embarrassed about the way that they had voted oh. back then. And so, did they release it 20, 10 no, years he ago? Read, he read me bits, <laughs> but he wouldn't. Read, oh, he, would, he would have been able to. By then the book was out. But I remember Pat Garrity, um, John Coates does honour the, Olymp the Moscow Olympians um, mm. very much so. He wasn't part of the AOF back then, but he was on the sideline feeding mm. stuff in um, to the younger members of the AOF. And um, and the he he had a at the annual general meeting when it was 30 years after moscow he invited me and he invited pat garrity who was the head of what was called the siemens union back then and the the unions had come in support of us because the sponsors were dropping out and so pat got up mm, and i remember he had that. no problem you know talking <laughs> reminding everybody what it was like for us um, mm. And you could feel the tension in the room then. Like yeah. they didn't want to be reminded of what had happened. Um, mm. And oh, look, that's that's everywhere, isn't it? If we talk about how we're treating our First Nations people, we, we don't have the maturity somehow or the capacity to be able to hold something that happened then and actually just go, yeah, um, it, I, I've changed my mind 
and mm. I and I wish that I hadn't been I wish I'd known more or maybe I voted another way or whatever it happens to be but instead we directed a sort of frustration that somebody should be bringing this up and that I should have to feel uncomfortable about it and yet that's maturity isn't it being able to hold all that arises mm. and actually just reflect on it in a way that's mature and um, sensible common sense <laughs> yes and we only do that at the rate that we're prepared to do that we can't hasten maturity we can't hasten no. adulthood no matter what the number is yeah. how old we are um there are, i was speaking with my husband this morning we we're having a cup of tea together um and we we're just sharing the things that we think are so common sense today and we know are us taking responsibility and we know that that's maturity that was beyond us five years ago lisa so i i never judge anyone who struggles with what seems to be the way it is that cognitive dissonance i'm really respectful that yeah. that that can't be broached just because i think they should or because no. i think they should know better no and that's I, right yeah i agree with you totally agree with you in that sense i guess the um no i want and what i'm speaking about more is um yeah, well, that's where compassion comes in. Isn't totally. It? You know, total, we have to, we, yes. we need to be compassionate. Everybody has come from a different place. Yeah. And so their way of relating to the world is based on the way they've been brought up and the way, yeah. that, you know, certain emotions have been allowed to be expressed in yep. their home. Yes. And so forcing it on somebody else, you're right, is, and it's, and it's, it has a, it's counterintuitive because people shut down even more. Yeah. So it's that kind of, you know, I'm not going to think that way because I am just so angry that you've even made me feel uncomfortable. And we can, yeah. you know, talk about that. Yeah, we will. Mindfulness. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, um, you're right in terms of, you know, where I think that as a, I think that as a nation, I think it's as parents, even the notion that um, we will all get old. <laughs> does that mean we all grow up? No. You know, and what is growing up? And yes. what is maturity? Um, yeah. And I think that, it's, we're in a really interesting place, I think, too, in terms of a society in, uh, in that, how, is it being encouraged, you know, <laughs> growing up or, True. or and somehow it's um, a negative, like, I guess we, you know, we love youth and, and we sort of honour all mm. of that, but I'm in that um, transitional period, if you like, in what I, I mean, in terms of menopause, but I've learned that the Japanese call it second spring. So yeah. I've been exploring, you know, what the second spring is and how yeah. you are able to move into the second spring and enjoy it. And I think a lot of that you know, comes from or the ability to enjoy your second spring is that you were able to be present and um, explore all the things that you wanted to explore in the first in your first spring. Um, I think so it's also can, letting go. The second yeah, letting go spring of what you didn't. Yeah, forgiving of, yourself. Of letting go of what you didn't and letting go of what you can no longer. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And that's a real skill. It is. It's it's one that you you'll take your last. I'll take my last breath. Still trying to still trying. To. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we dived into where we're we heading, did. but I just want to make sure that our viewers also know that you won. I think it was two gold medals at the I Brisbane did. Commonwealth yeah. Games. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Was the training there a softer experience? I can't quite remember what you said about that. Uh, what had happened was, no, by that point I knew that I had trouble with my thinking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I was, uh, I did, but nobody talked about anxiety or anything like that. Yeah. Back then. Um, but what had happened also was that by the time I, just before the Olympic game or before the Commonwealth game, so it was a, it was a bit of a, um, not knowing how to relieve the pressure that you were putting on yourself because I'd won yes. the silver medal that first time. I had only, when I was eight years old and I saw those girls at the Olympic Games in 1972 and I thought, I want to do that, yeah. I'd made the calculation that 1980, I don't know that it had been decided it was in Moscow at that point, but 1980, I would be 16, I'd be in year 11. Yeah. That was the games I could go to and get on with the rest of my life. Yes. But once the silver medal happened in 78, yeah. everyone said to me, oh, you'll go one better in four years. So suddenly yeah. that, you know, is extended. Oh, yeah, I'll go in four years' time. And it's yeah. Brisbane. So yes. although I must say at the time, I was like, Brisbane? I can go to Brisbane any time. I want to travel somewhere. Yeah. So I have no comprehension of the magnificence of, an, of a home crowd. Yes, yes. Um, but I was sort of struggling because I'd done my HSC that year before. I'd taken time off um, as mum wanted. So I finished in the top 10% in the state, did my HSC. That was up to the Olympics. And then went back into the pool um, to, you know, go one better at yeah. the Commonwealth Games. 
Um, and so even though I felt like I had all of the reasons that I should be motivated, you know, for the first time, mum would and dad would be able to see me swim for Australia. You know, mm. I was trying to go one better and win a gold medal. All these sorts of things. I just had this heavy weight on my shoulder and I did not know how to relieve it. And then yeah. um, Rocky, Rocky 3 was released yeah. in the cinema just uh, about a month before the training, the trials. Now, I'd been swimming like a dog. And so I was really struggling and I was okay once I got to the pool. That's what I couldn't understand. Like once I was in the water, I was fine, but it was in between those sessions. I was yeah. torturing myself. Mm. Um, and then Rocky comes in and it's pretty specific to my moment. If you remember yeah. Rocky three, it's, I do, um, you know, he's um, club of tea has come in or club of Lang, isn't he? Mr. T was playing club of Lang yeah. and he'd, um, he'd beaten Rocky. And of course, Mickey, his trainer sort of died in that opening uh, scenes mm. of that movie. And uh, Apollo Creed comes back and he's training Rocky because he's pretty angry with the way that, you know, Clover Lang's sort of behaving. And But Rocky's just not there. And, and mm. then, you know, his beautiful wife, Adrian, sort of forces him to tell her what's wrong. And he says, I'm scared. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm scared. And, and she says, look, you know, in the, the years ahead where it's just going to be you and me and you can handle losing, but you can't handle walking away. And so I'm in the cinema. I thought I would just be going in to enjoy Rocky. And I'm just like, he's, and so it tells the story of the champ coming back. And I think, yeah. you know, I was able to process things. I didn't even know how to say. Yeah. Um, and I walked out of that cinema and if I was, if you like, in flow, like we didn't have a word for that, but yeah. suddenly I had no doubt. Rocky had reminded, you know, my body and my mind that I knew how to win. And yeah. so I was just on a roll. From that moment, everything became easier. My just my energy was back, and I came second at the trials in both 100 and 200. And it was, you know, it was kind of interpreted as like, oh yes, so then you know the the mm. successes have now moved into their rightful place. And I was, mm. a bit, but I had been I was been swimming so badly that I knew I was just like on the yeah. way up. Yeah. And so um, it was really interesting. And so you know, it all went so beautifully. I won the 100, which I had never expected to do. And that was just pure thrill and sort of just oh, elation and surprise and all of the joy that yeah. comes with something so unexpected. But the 200 was interesting because it was more, you know, it was the race that I was expected to win. So on the other side of that, uh, once I'd won, I didn't have that same elation. It was always interested me that yeah. I seemed to just be so kind of like I'd done it. It was a sense of satisfaction because later on I learned that contentment and satisfaction is almost a neutral feeling. It's, yes. it's not something that we try to strive for in many mm. ways and um and so mm. I sort of was a bit surprised by that but nevertheless mm. I won my gold medals and later on mm. I would learn through mindfulness and compassion oh right that's contentment and it's okay to just be yeah. in that place it just means the job well done you know so did you question yourself not feeling more excited at winning the gold oh there was no no there was it I was I still remember being on the you know at the end and mum and dad are jumping up and down and I was like try please get there I was like no yeah there's nothing there it's more just yeah I did it you know, I did it after all those four years. I hung in. I got there, and and it was yeah. done. It was it was still obviously happy and um and content. I think. One of the things you write about in Glide, and I love this, is we tend to discount neutral moments. We oh, discount yeah. the neutral emotions, and I often have people a lot say to me, "So you excited? Because there's lots of good things. Are you excited? Mm. I don't want to disappoint you, but that's not the word. It feels we're heading there." Yeah, and it will yeah. be what it will be. But I I really have tried to knock off the extremes because I I don't want this in my life. I, mm, I want mm. more this about mm. the externals. It it seems exhausting to live on a roller coaster of extreme emotions. So I do get what you're saying. I'm just surprised you had it so young, a feeling of, yes. yes. Oh, and I think, well, I'm scared of, of it because it doesn't feel right, does it? It should be, you should, I should have been like I was in the 100. There was that. Yeah. And yet it wasn't. So you just was like, no, that's not there. So yeah. you just sit in what it is. And then I felt the same way. I remember again when I was pregnant with my son um, and I, I felt like it, it was because I was 38. It had happened in the first month. My best yeah. friend had um, been given no time to live. And I was like, what are yeah. you waiting for, Lisa? Get pregnant. Or, you know, try. And yeah. we thought it'd be months because I was... Yes so old not old but old for having mm. a child and um and yeah that feeling of um when it actually happened and I remember driving along South Dowling Street after I'd gone to tell mum and dad and there was this beautiful pink sky it was sort of June and um and it was twilight and I remember thinking wow how had I managed this like I 
I wanted to go to the Olympics. I got there. I wanted to write a book. I got there. I wanted to be a sports reporter. I did that and all these yeah. things. Yeah. And you actually then managed to be pregnant and have yeah. a baby, which had not been on my bucket list at all, you know. Yes. And and there was that feeling again. And I, I mean, I must say, I was a bit scared. Like, what if I don't want to do anything else? Mm. <laughs> yeah. So I've now learned I don't have to fear it. And I had a similar feeling just Mother's Day, you know, just gone past. I was actually by myself. My son was in Canberra. He's studying down there. My husband was with his mum. She'd had an operation. And I was just with my sister. We, we were up at Lennox Head. And my son, my husband was only 30 minutes away. But I had this beautiful morning of um, I woke early and I thought, oh, I'll just go to the cafe and read this book that I was really enjoying. And I was sitting there in, um, you know, in the cafe, there's lots of young par parents with young kids. And I was feeling so like my job is done. I've raised yeah. a beautiful boy. He's, yeah. You know, everyone keeps telling me, you know, how terrific he is. I think he is, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, his girlfriend's best friend said to me, I couldn't ask for a nicer guy for my girl, my best friend. So, yeah. you know, you've done the right thing by the girls, which is yeah. really important, I think, when you're raising boys. Yes. Yes. Um, and it was that feeling of, yeah, you can, I was not scared of it at all. It was just that really still feeling of job well done. You've raised, mm, you've, you've good done on you. Job. Yeah. So well, I think that worth learning not to be scared of it, as you say. The yeah. Well, I think it's worth sharing the viewers now why that's such a big deal in your life to get to that point. <laughs> because Glide, whilst it talks about the highs and the lows of the external world, I think the conversation that's worth having with you now is, there was a very different narrative going on within you during this yeah. time. And I, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but I just get this sense that you've been wrestling with you all through that journey. So you were not just competing in a race, you were competing with yourself, with how you suppressed emotions, with how you denied yourself the painful thoughts. That I can't even imagine how you go out from the blocks planning to win when this isn't working for you. And for a while there, your mind did not work for your success, for your ultimate support of you. No, no. And I didn't know that. Until, I didn't no. know that you are, well, I was sort of conscious of it, but I didn't know what to do with it. I knew once Rocky had changed my thinking, yeah. like I told journalists after I won the, those gold medals that, um, that I had trouble with my thinking. And Rocky yeah. had changed it. So I knew that. Yeah. I also knew before the Olympic um, final, which is, you know, another, I've st spoken about it before, but sitting in that yeah. ready room, I heard the thought, I don't know how to do this. Yes. And I was so, I was like, of course you do. And I wrestled, I fought myself yeah. in my own yes. head and kind of created, I mean, I guess you might call it a panic attack now. I don't know, but, and was able to steady myself and kind of get myself out there in a way, uh, in a you know way that was effective until I got into that, into the, onto the blocks. But um yeah, so I had this what I called trouble with my thinking. And then so the book before Glide was a teenage novel set in the circus. I'd never written fantasy before, but I thought I'd have a go. And I just, again, took myself down into spirals of doubt. And mm. I knew all the time, I think it is one of the fortunate things, I suppose, and I knew that it was internal. I knew it wasn't something, there was nobody else to blame. No. It was somebody, something that I was doing. And so I started, I signed up to a coaching course at first, a life yeah. coaching course, because I thought, well, like there's lots more modern techniques now that obviously yeah. what was happening back then wasn't modern. And so, and that was great, except that it was another goal setting course. And I didn't yes. need to set another goal. I wanted yes. to be um, content with the goals that I'd picked, if you like. Yeah. But um, because I had to, um, you know, as a, I had to go and do some coaching as well in order to practice, you know, to get my cert four, I actually realized that I wasn't the only one who had that, no. what I call miss, miss never enough inside That's my it. head. <laughs> yeah. So I had these two competing voices, if you like. I have this miss, oh, I'll have a go at that, you know, like mm. that seems interesting. I'd like to write a book or, you mm. know, I'd like to be an interviewer. And so I've got her, she's always there. And then I had this miss never enough. And, mm. And, and I had that, um, that, that first start that we described of the DY ladies sort of encouragement. I didn't, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. What I, what I, I thought that all of my success had been a result of that. My coach sports psychology back then was mottos across the top of a blackboard. And my mm. favorite motto was when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I was introduced to it at 13, at 14, I was swimming for Australia. I'm like, right, that's it. That's it. <laughs> But as you, you know, as I've said, by that third week at training camp in Hawaii, I didn't know how to, where's the motto that said I've been tough enough. Yeah. And so more often than not, I was driving myself into the pool, into sort of exhaustion mm -hmm. and getting sick. Um, and by the time I had Terry Gathapol as a coach later on in the lead up to those Commonwealth, or well, the Olympics and Commonwealth Games, he would tell people that, you know, you've got to be careful of it because she'll drive herself to illness. 
And now we know that that never enough story, it's just called the language of scarcity. You know, we mm. all have it from the moment we wake up yeah. in the morning, didn't get enough sleep, don't have enough time, don't have enough money, don't have enough respect, don't have enough willpower, don't have enough, no, but, you know, fill mm. in the blanks. Yeah. Um, and so that's the language of scarcity. And while we're doing that, we're just draining, you know, the, the um, parts of our brain, the, well, we're, we're draining the sort of the drive section of the brain, but we're just feeding the stress hormones all the time because, mm you know, your, you know, your, your podcast is called perspective, like the capacity to stand back and mm. say, hold on a minute, there's another way of looking yep. at this is a really a powerful skill. Mm. So I did the course. And then through that co coaching course, I was introduced to, I did a webinar, it was non compulsory on something called mindfulness based stress reduction. Yeah. Um, and I still didn't get it at the end of the um, <laughs> class. I was like, I don't see why I have to sit still. <laughs> like, why do I have to sit down and meditate? I don't get it. So I well, it's, worth, I, it's worth mentioning here that up until then you had replaced, you used exercise as a way exactly. not to be with yourself. And I wonder how many people are listening to this, insert your choice of distraction here so you okay. don't have to be yourself. And you also mentioned in Glide, the study where how long can a participant sit in a room alone yeah, and they're told like there's a buzzer there they can press that will give themselves an electric shock. And some people didn't even last five minutes. They'd rather give themselves pain than sit quietly with their thoughts. Isn't so that incredible. It's, that was the University of Virginia, I think it was. Study, that study yeah. always blows me away. And blows um, you away. Blows me away that people, most people, was majority of people, would rather give themselves the stimulus of pain, the distraction, from just being still with their thoughts. And, and there's was, the other one too. So the, the, I thought the other one that was interesting was, I think it was the Harvard study. It was around 2010 now, so it's quite old, but it was, uh, you know, many, many people with a with a, an app on their phone. So every so often it would pop up and say, uh, is, are you, is your mind on task or is it, um, are you distracted? And they were, I think it was 48% of the time we were distracted. Yeah. And the distraction was not helping us be happier. Because yeah. yes, you might be ruminating about that, you know, next holiday in I don't know yeah. somewhere beyond our shores. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. One, you know, in our in our one day, <laughs> some one day. Um, but then there may be, oh well, it's not fair. Why I'm allowed to go? And maybe some fears about the coronavirus, whatever it happens to be. You know, the yeah. rumination kicks in. Um, so yeah, so that's so I wrote down the name John Cabot Zinn, and mm. um, and suddenly um, uh. Uh, so I went to, that's right, after the website uh, uh, webinar, I went to Audible and I looked up all the books of it. Maybe this John Kabat-Zinn has a book and, of course, he was the grandfather of mindfulness. So he had millions of books, but lots of them were, uh, un were abridged. So mm. I chose the only unabridged book and started listening to it when I went walking the next morning. I think it was and, the, adventures, um, the Adventures of Mindfulness. Adventures of it's mindfulness, no longer yeah. available on Audible, by the way, because I wanted to read no. it Audible before our chat i think yeah i think it's on sounds true now because when you. i went to find him yeah when i went Thank looking you. for now you're trying me. to get the quote <laughs> i know well it was interesting because i went looking for eventually i actually emailed don cabot zinn or I yeah. emailed the center for mindfulness to get his approval um so it was tricky to find and um mm. they were surprised actually i think that it was on audible at the time anyway yeah the, 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 the story was that I then go walking the next morning. Chapter three starts with a, a basic breath meditation. I'm supposed to be sitting down. I'm walking saying, thanks very yep. much, but I can, I can at least feel my breath and walk. And, um, and he says, okay, so we're going to feel the breath. And, uh, and so, you know, we're, I'm feeling the breath. And he said, now you might be thinking, oh, this isn't too bad. You know, I'm, 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 I'm feeling my breath. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm thinking. And he said, well, that's great, except that's a thought. And we're mm -hmm. not trying to think. We're just trying to feel the breath. Mm. So let's just let go of the thought and come back to the simple feeling of the breath. And I was like, what did he say? Mm. <laughs> I can let go of the thought by coming back to the breath. Yeah. And I, I mean, I was on the corner of Oxford Street and, and Moore Park Road up the top. I almost did circles. Like, why didn't somebody tell me this 30 years ago when I was sitting in the ready room before the Olympic final that I could let go of a thought by coming back to the feeling of the breath? Well, I think now, sure important, enough, it's hard for, sorry, for the mind to do that, but it is possible. It, <laughs> well, it, 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 is, it is tough to do, but it's hard. It would have been hard for you in that you trained yourself to disconnect from your body. Your body was just a, a weapon or a tool to get you down the pool. I didn't read up. I think I read you correctly. You'd never learned or experienced being in your body. You were here knowing what you had to do inverted commas what you felt you had to do but that at no time had you taught yourself or had the experience of or been exposed to this idea 
all of me is here, not just the bit that's got to think my way through this panic and I better, but I hope I don't let everyone. That isn't all of you. This just became a tool. I think it, my feeling as I read at least was everything below here was simply a weapon or a tool to get the job done. The next job, the next job, the next job. Even exercise was treated that way. And so to just have that ability, did you do it successfully in that first time? I can't imagine you did, that you actually sat and felt your body. It would have been an alien, surreal experience to even know that was a, that was a conversation you could have with yourself. Um, I certainly, I think that one of the, definitely privileged this, although I, I think what, one of the things that I found interesting about practicing mindfulness is that I could, I did not know that I could learn to regulate an emotion in exactly the way that I yeah. had regulated myself through, yes. a, through, a, through a race. So I trained my body to remain equanimous or to yeah. maintain equanimity all the yeah. way to the end. Yeah. Even when I, you know, was screaming with pain or yeah. my thoughts were like, I don't want to, you know, I, I want to give up or not that I ever thought yeah. I want to give up, but, you know, toward the end of a race when it's really, really tough, I trained Amazing. myself to stay, keep your stroke long, keep your breath long, you know, mm. you're checking, 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 checking yeah. all the time. And I didn't know that I could do that with an emotion. Yes. So the moment that I was feeling anxious, as you say, the trouble with my thinking, I didn't have trouble with my thinking. No. What I have is a, what we all have is a habitual way of thinking that yep. protects us. Yes. And we learned when we were little that this protected us somehow. The way that we behave protected us and kept us loved or kept us in contact with those that we needed. And what I didn't realize was that it was just a habit to actually stop myself from feeling, as you say. But if we actually can drop into the body, when the going gets tough, the tough get going, I've now reframed, you know, in terms of when the going gets tough, the tough drop into the body and feel what they're feeling, Yeah. you know, and it comes to an emotion, right? And so if I'm feeling really worked up, then it's ha there's something going on in the body. So can I drop into the body and just feel what's going on? So you're absolutely right. I had no connection. It wasn't the breath meditation that I had such trouble with. No. But when the body scan, he had a he had a body scan at the beginning of chapter five, and I started doing that, and I was like, I can't feel anything. Yeah. Oh, well, I must be doing it wrong. So I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't do it. Yeah. So eventually, once I started doing mindfulness based stress reduction, I the body scan is the first two weeks, and I was just just like, I can't feel anything. What's going mm. on? And so I was so excited when finally I felt you know, the tingle in my big yeah. toe. So I was so disconnected from this. Yeah. That it took me a long time to actually um, come back into my body, and now. Um, you know, what a, I just, I have so much more, um, uh, well, I can just do it all the time, which is really yeah. nice. I could just a skill now. And I think Good. that when you say about whether you can do it or not, I think one of the wonderful things about this whole practice of mindfulness and compassion is that it's really like advanced common sense. Buddhist psychology is known as advanced common sense, Yeah, but it's really forgiving in that mm. we're human. So yeah, mm. the mind wanders. Mm. It's going to wander. That's okay. The moment you wake up and find out that you are not in the present, come back to the body, come back to the breath, come back to a sound, whatever it is that you have chosen as your anchor. And I found that I call myself a recovering perfectionist. Like I just think it's a beautiful practice for perfectionists because guess what? We're not perfect. So yeah. I had this idea that I had to be perfect when I was a yeah, teenager. Of course. We don't. We don't. We can't. Yeah. <laughs> what a relief. Yes. One of the quotes you put in the book that I love is between stimulus and response, there is a mm. space. In that space is our power to choose a response by Viktor mm. Frankl. Mm. That's one of my favorite as a coach. So good. That is pretty well my central philosophy that there's a stimulus and that immediate, what I call reactivity right there, that reactivity that creates the mess, the drama, the noise in our lives or distracts us or prevents us being our truer selves. You don't get rid of that. You pause and you start noticing there is a space before that where all the gold is. The treasure is in that pause. I'm saying that to myself right now as much as anything. <laughs> I know. We have to remind ourselves all, all the, time. the time. And what and what I really love um, about it is that one of the, um, I think, you know we call it a superpower I, well I do is curiosity because you once yeah. you when you're practicing you know mindfulness you, it's just an awareness practice right so being aware of what is arising right now in this moment yeah so you know I might be you know oh in my mind am I talking too fast I have a tendency to talk too fast I'm checking in with that all the time as I talk to you um but rather that the the way to actually um 
that, that wasn't necessarily the best um, uh, um, example. Yeah, because that's already the reactivity that's kicking yeah, in. It's the it's bit more, before that. Yeah, so it's more exactly. So I'm just all just making sure that in my body I'm breathing, I'm yeah. feeling my body in the chair, I'm feeling yeah. my feet on the ground. And, yeah, it's more that moment where, yeah, you've, you know, you, you're in an argument with your husband and or your son <laughs> and something is on the tip of your tongue. But yes. if you say it, you know, you're going to wreck your marriage for the next 24 hours or maybe forever. So that capacity to go, I'm feeling, what am I feeling? When I say what, what's going on, that's curiosity. So the, the, the tension when the stress hormones are, are activating is we're contracted. And the moment we go, what's happening? As you say, like if I'm talking too fast, okay, if my shoulders tense, can I just actually let my shoulders down? Can I just actually be with my breath? Can I just feel what I'm feeling? Say it's anger or frustration or, you know, your children are not behaving in the way that you want to. Can you actually just come back? What's going on in my body? And the moment we turn fear into curiosity, of course, we open up and we're able to, the contraction goes, we've got space between stimulus and response to actually then choose the best way to respond in that mm. moment. For me, it's also I'm going to add a dollop of yeah, and give myself the pause to recognize one of the hardest lessons a human being can ever, ever, ever learn. <laughs> yeah, I think that I know what you're going to say. Stimulus <laughs> was not the reason for my response. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, son, that's right. The stimulus is never the reason for the response as hard as that is in the moment, but they, but you don't understand. But if you knew what happened, if you knew what they, they should never, all of those moments, however extreme it is, this is so tough. We still have a choice. And that's what Viktor Frankl gave us. That was his gift of that book. The choice is not in the stimulus happening, not necessarily. Shit's going to happen. The choice is in how we respond um, over and over and re-choosing and re-choosing and re-choosing. Yeah, yeah. And to and me, even understanding, oh, sorry that, to interrupt you, that understanding that it's, it's actually triggering something, yeah, from, from the past, yeah. from another time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just being able to forgive yourself at that moment and go, oh, right, that's interesting that that's arising. Yeah, it's got nothing. People, nobody is going to behave in the way you want them to no. all of the time. <laughs> and I think that's, that's, you know, that's what the, the Buddha observed, you know, two yeah. and a half thousand years ago. Life yeah. is inherently unsatisfactory because. We and unfair. Everything. <laughs> and, you know, painful sometimes. And there's yeah. going to be moments of joy and there's going to be moments of incredible beauty all around us if we are open to it. Mm. So if we're, if we're stressed, then our, you know, our attentional resources are so narrow and so focused on that stimulus, perhaps. Mm. But if we can look around and go, wow, you know, what a gorgeous day it is outside. I can hear the birds. I, you know, I'm alive in this moment and um, I'm feeling my body. And what an incredible thing the body is that I don't even have to pay attention and it will breathe <laughs> for me. Yes. You know, that there's, there's where you start to, you have agency, as you say, you've got, you're mm. empowered. You actually can. And I think that's what so that's what appealed to me because as an athlete, you know, you are training your body. It, you're interested in that. You've got, you've got an awareness practice already. So the capacity to actually go, oh, well, actually I'm training my mind as well. It's just like doing a bicep curl, yeah. doing like anything else. That, um, and I think once you understand that, that in fact, there's a whole lot of things, there's a whole lot of things I can't control. There's something I can control and it's right yes. here. That's Not the in only a way fear. that I'm going to be limited. I'm going to be no. rigid in that control, but I can control my response. And I can, well, I can even set a, a, an idea, have an ideal of the way that I want to respond, like a belief about how I want to be mm. in the world. Um, mm. And I think that's, you know, we're talking about second spring that there's so many people that you hear going, oh, I'm not noticed anymore. I'm not this anymore. And you go, well, actually, are we, are you, what? I had a friend, a mother, she was just reading about, she was reading about, um, you know, menopause and all the things that were going to go wrong long before it arrived. And so she's like, then she was saying, no, no one's noticing me anymore. And then I saw her one day for a coffee. She said, this bloke said to her, she walked past, it's okay, love, things aren't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> so we can carry stuff in aside us that might not have anything to do with what's going on. And so we're going to lose this moment reflecting on what, what exactly. wasn't and what isn't. One of the things my husband and I on a good day do, we take this... <laughs> We take this quote between stimulus and response, there is a space. And if one of us says something that could call, create 
we decide there's reactivity because of what they say. I'm not going to say they caused my reactivity. Although no, no, when no. I'm arguing with him, Lisa, and I want to win, he caused my reactivity. Just so we're clear. <laughs> just so we're clear. It depends on the way. have to know that spot, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but there's something that he does, says whatever, and I can feel my reactivity. What we're both doing now is stretching the pores out. So instead of it doesn't happen all the time. So anyone's listening thinking we're nailing no, no, no. flawed as flawed as, but more and more we're expanding the pause. So I might, if he says a, you know, a thing that I think is incredibly dumb and offensive, you know, which is what he's going to do is never me. Um, I am going to slow down the pause and say, I can feel myself about to really fire up right now. Yeah. I'm just going to give myself a bit of space and I'm just expanding mm -hmm. the pause in slow mo. Mm -hmm. And I say, we need to slow down our speaking. We need to breathe. Because mm -hmm. right now I'm about to do my thing, mm -hmm. which will mean you'll do your thing and this pause will be gone. So this to me is the game changer for every relationship, not just with ourselves, but with others. And I've done it with a couple of friends as well. It's like, man, I can feel myself heating and rushing into yeah. that space right now. And I do it in coaching as well, by the way, Lisa, I'm sure, I'm sure you do as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Something you just said, then I can feel mm -hmm. something come up in me rather than a respond straight away and think I'm coaching you. I'm going to acknowledge this is me right now. Mm -hmm. They just rush to expand in the space. So I'm just going to take a couple of breaths, sit with what came my way and what came up for me, feel what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you know when I'm back and fully present and capable of giving you my very best self once more. Mm -hmm. So we're learning to really slow down that pause and articulate what's going on in that pause. And I do it in my coaching and I do it in my relationships and I do it with myself. Mm -hmm. um, soon after I uh, started practicing, so eventually um, I did sit down for the um, breath meditation and, um, uh, and then my my husband noticed a you know a big a change and so yes. we started doing it yes so we we have a um a pretty strong practice together in the sense that he yeah. uh not that we always do it together but we are on the same wavelength and i think yeah. that makes a huge difference because you start yes. listening to the wisdom of these kinds of practices yeah and i mean we have always had we've been married for 21 years so we have kind of uh joy fun um you know a great romance we wanted to have you know a great romance we've got that as our as our goal and so if we're not um if we're not there then we always check in with what's you know we're yes we talk a lot. um but i think that the it just it that you are both practicing and actually understanding that yep thoughts will take you away and it's mm. not the place that you want to be and you keep coming mm. back to the center i think that as you say is it, it just becomes second nature to just take a breath or to say, or even to say something, Slow I'm so sorry, I should down. not have, yeah, you know what, I'm really sorry to actually say sorry in the yes. moment yeah. and to know and to admit that, you know, like my dad used to say, I don't know, love, I don't yeah. know where we are right now to actually live yes. in that I don't know is a love really, that. Um, you know, powerful place to be. And the beauty of um, the one good thing, if you like, out of the uh, lockdown last year is that my son was doing his HSC and um, Glide came out in April and of course all of the you know, the bookshops closed down, all the events yeah. closed down. And so I think out of, I don't know, he's feeling sorry for his mum. So he uh, read Glide. And so he said to me, mum, mum, can we meditate one day? I said, so I just led a, a basic breath meditation. And I said to him the next day, do you want to meditate? And he said, mum, you know, if you want me to do it, I won't do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so I actually gave him the 10% Happier app, which I use as well. Like, as, mm. And so they were giving three months free at the time. So he then sat down, he meditates every day. And the beauty of that, even when you have a teenager, I mean, obviously a 17 year old, so an older teenager, is that the conversations that we then have about what's arising and what's mm. going on for him and, and the thoughts that he's, you know, um, that are coming up and particularly, you know, as we got towards the HSC and the doubt, you know, the things that, that get in the way of our peace, if you like, or our yes. ability to be in the yeah. moment and to be in flow, which is, mm. you know, flow is that where skill and and um and um challenge and challenge meet you know in that beautiful concentrated place and so to actually be able to name what it is oh this is the thought that was coming up and and likewise you know i, I we always talk about getting to the body and i think that it's, it's 
talk about mother guilt like oh no I wasn't practicing when he was little I was like, no, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't only practicing when I was a yes. teenager what have I put on him but I keep saying to him come into the body so can you come into the body he gets frustrated with it but we know that you know yeah. we know that's the place to be because mm. then once you that slows you down as you say you're back in the present again you're not racing with your thoughts and yeah. um it's such a I think in that way just being aware, the awareness of what is arising at any particular moment so that you know how to proceed in the wisest possible way, that is a skill that all of us need. Yes. And with compassion. We haven't and the about own, that we, we need to get to compassion. It's the only pathway to peace. Yes. Yes. Everything and that's going on within ourselves <laughs> right? is pretty well global. It's all true. So you describe um a bird in your book in glide you say there's a bird that has two wings and one wing is mindfulness, mindfulness yeah. it's that pause and what you do with that pause and how you yeah. fill it with presence to self and i'm paraphrasing obviously and then the other wing is built on compassion and particularly self-compassion which the dy ladies brought you yeah. when you were a child and then you unlearned it and then relearned yeah. it that's how i envisioned you would describe it totally yeah yeah so, um that um, I didn't realize um, until, yeah, we were in that place of, um, I, I thought, oh, well, I'd stopped. I was doing the course and then um, a mom approached me about her, about whether I coach teenagers. Um, and I was really new to it at the time and I didn't know her teenager was self-harming at that point. Yeah. Um, and so um, they were with, um, you know, professionals in that sort of area. So they were beyond my, what I was skilled at at the time. Um, and so, but we did get to talk about how the anxiety might have taken hold. And it was a sort of similar story. Started in a running race at school, mm. um, a swimming race. It got it done really well, um, got all the way to the state championships and then balked at the final. Mm. And, um, and so uh, the mum said to me, oh, we thought, oh, well, it's one thing to have natural talent, but another to have um, temperament. If you don't have the temperament, there's nothing you can do. And so the parents didn't um, uh, make their child run. Um, and then after that, all sorts of problems, just the anxiety, just balked at doing anything new um, and anxiety turned to depression and time off school and then the self harming oh, wow. And so, and of course, at that point, I was, I was sort of processing what I'd heard. I'd been telling the story of the DY ladies for a good 15 years at school, always as a kind of quaint way of how I started in the sport compared to these professional days, you know, mm. down at the beach, sandy, all that mm. sort of stuff, waves coming in over the rock pool. Um, and suddenly I was like, oh, my God, temperament can be trained because I, mm -hmm. I know because my temperament has had been trained. And then with that story, I then remembered not just the DY ladies, but there were another like four times from the age of four, eight, eight to 14 where I was in tears before stepping up to the next um, challenge yeah. and someone was kind. Someone yeah. offered me, a, walked beside me, held my hand, told me a story, did something mm -hmm. that helped me overcome my fear encouraged me it's an old-fashioned word enable yeah. courage to take on that next challenge and of course once I did the the joy of um, achieving something and the satisfaction is there um, and so I realized that actually I you know I called it can do kindness at first and then that's what I learned is the essentially the definition of compassion which I thought was always weak we talk about compassion overload and all this sort of stuff it's sort of a weakness that you feel too much for other people but in fact empathy or the way that um I've learned it is empathy is the internal sort of circle. If you like, there's two circles. So you empathize with what's going on. So the DY ladies empathize with my they fear did. that I might drown, put a girl in the water, that I wouldn't drown. And so then the rest of it is all in your head. And so encourage me on. So there's empathy in the center and then an outer circle of courage and high action. And I think that that's that, as you mentioned, that two wings of the bird, it wasn't my analogy. It's, it's um, been floating around for a while, but mindfulness by itself can be pretty cold and also it can be pretty yeah. self-centered. Yes, you know, whereas can. compassion is, is, is the ability to actually, you know, be in connection with other people, if you mm. like. And so I think that compassion, you, compassion is the heart. You know, it's often said that the mind creates the abyss and the heart creates um, the bridge. And um, I think that mindfulness and well, John Kabat-Zinn would say that in uh, Asian cultures, the heart, the, there is the same symbol for the heart and the mind. So if you're not thinking, if you're thinking of mindfulness without compassion, you're not actually thinking properly of what mm. it is. And even with that, um, that capacity to say, like in that moment, you, you're in the ready room, you're facing three East Germans and the thought comes into your mind, I don't know how to do this, which is essentially what happened. The capacity to go, oh, it's okay. That's just mm. natural. That's human. Our brains yeah. have, have a negativity bias. That's yeah. the way we've evolved. It's normal that you would be feeling like this. Yes. It's okay. We're going to be able to get through this. 
Mm. So that capacity to say to yourself in those moments, come on, sweetheart, you can do this Yeah. Um, without fear. So definitely I was saying, come on, sweetheart, you could do this when I was trying to meet eight and nine kilometre sessions. <laughs> but then that's also the ability to say, hold on a minute, what you need right now is to be able to speak up and say, that's not what I do at home. And I was waiting for somebody else to do it for me. Yes. So it's not like compassion is always rolling over and just being able to, no. just doing what somebody tells you. Yeah. It's the capacity to say, this is unfair. It's going to take some courage, but I'm mm. going to speak up now. Yeah. One of the things for me with compassion is it gets mistaken for weakness. And I think the word vulnerability yeah. is worth mentioning here. Um, Brene Brown speaks beautifully about yeah. vulnerability and what a necessary ingredient in this. There were many moments in your book, Lisa, where I felt your vulnerability <laughs> and so clearly. And it was just those moments, if only you had known to say, this is normal, what I'm feeling is okay. You can sit with what you're feeling right now and nothing has to change. You are not in any way broken. Nothing needs fixing. That's right. And isn't it a gift to give it to your clients when you coach? It's, it's I don't everybody. think the coaching no. research talks about it nearly enough no, to bring no. normalization and acknowledgement that where they're at is absolutely normal. Um, the first time it was ever said to me, I burst into tears with relief. Yeah. I was 37 the first time it was said to me. Mm, mm, mm. My dear friend Jen said I was going through a big challenge. Yeah. She said, of course you're feeling fear. Anyone in your situation would. You're facing a new level. You're breaking through a boundary. How could you not feel what you're feeling? And it never felt such a relief. It all just fell off my shoulders. I'm normal? I, I thought I was the only one who was this loser person worrying about things everybody else was just getting. The whole planet needs a big dose of normalization, acknowledgement, validation of where you're at. Just that's mindful compassion to me. That is mindful compassion at its best. Yeah. When you see the person where they're at and you fully normalize and embrace it. What a yeah. gift. Yeah. And how do we how do we somehow get away from that? That's what's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Too? Yes. Like where how is it that we because I think that my grandmother, who's now no longer with us, she would have been able to do it. Okay. You know, I wonder about that and and I don't know, or maybe not. No, because I'm, maybe I'm imagining it because she was, you know, not in uh, my tribe. Of, but no, no. And I think so. How does that happen? Well, I think that's also that kind of, you know, well, there's all of those many, many different um, mottos, if you like. That you know, the, the, I mean, the the kind Stoicism. of tough love idea comes from. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Um, my son has taken. He, so he, he got into meditating and the Stoics. I've read a bit more about the Stoics um, recently, and I I, mm. I think that there is, um, it's that element of control that's kind of interesting because we, because when we talk about the ability to control how you respond to the world, we're not talking about controlling the world. We're not talk, no. we're not talking about it in a in a rigid way. We're talking about, as you say, about the about being vulnerable and you know being like the tree that bends with whatever's no. going, being flexible and and that's what um. Um, I think I went, did I, was it in the book? I, I went looking for the word, um, what was the word? It was what, resilience, I think it was. And I'd always thought resilience was about toughening up. But in yeah. fact, when you look at the look at the meaning of the word, resilience when it comes to a substance is something that's flexible and yeah. something that's able to bend and move and shape. And I think that's what we're trying to, uh, that's what we're talking about in terms of control, being able to be equanimous with whatever is arising. Okay, there's this very strange situation. Last year was weird. Now we've got another weird year when it comes to waiting for vaccines mm -hmm. and, and whether or not we open. So can we sit with that not knowing and still, as you say, feel vulnerable, but also feel empowered that we, uh, we can manage, that we can manage what's going on. And uh, I look, think we've never been further away from that as a culture. No. I don't think we've right. ever been further. I'm sure you study CBT as I do, cognitive behavioral therapy and the Stoics. And you know, to be an effective coach, these are the types of narratives we need to be familiar mm. with. But the more I'm familiar with that narrative, the less I see it in social media, or I see it in the media, or I see it in the way politicians speak, or even just how people yell at each other. This basic, beautiful Frank um, Frankel's saying, everything's in the pause, everything's in mm. that space, the it's power nice. is in the space. 
that's people's immediate reactions are there faster and quicker than ever. The fast comeback is everything and gotcha media and the gotcha teardown and the shaming. That is all the absolute complete reverse of everything we're discussing. Yeah. Mindful. That's, that's radical. Uh, you know, it is radical what we're doing. I, and I think that's why mindfulness is so, is so is scary for some people and it's not yeah. embraced. I mean, it's easy to kind of, you know, dismiss it as a, as a fad or it's easy to go to the next gimmicky thing if you like because it's because faster think, mindfulness yeah, next faster. time <laughs> that's right <laughs> and it actually slows things down but also it, it um it brings you back to oh what yeah. am i what can i take responsibility for well that's the hardest thing to do and i think that's this, as society is i certainly don't think that i'm pro, you know no. in that don't that, don't even assume that at all but it's well it's no i do goal. it my husband doesn't <laughs> exactly <laughs> I'm fine. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> no. I know. I know. So that's, but even things like uh, recently I read, you know, we have the second highest uptake of antidepressants in the mm. OECD, mm. in the country that we live in. And the thing and we say is, is because we're finally acknowledging the problems. It's not just that. It's now we focus on problems and mindfulness and compassion tells us where our focus goes, the energy will flow and we'll get more of that. And I'm oversimplifying a whole bunch of neuroscience yeah. here, but it's worth looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, mindfulness studies. And the research does show, the neuroscience research shows we will get and experience more neural pathways about what we focus on than anything else. So it's worth making a really conscious decision about what we pour into this and what we allow yeah. to take residence here, because yeah, it's I very think... easy to do that spiral. I've done that. Mm, mm, we all have. We all have. Yeah. I remember um, seeing Lindy Chamberlain speak one year at the oh, Happiness wow. and its Causes conference, and yes. uh, she even, you know, this was long before I'd met mindfulness, but she talked about the fact that. Um, you know, up here is like her lounge room. And why would yeah. she let people in her lounge room Amazing. that were going to say horrible things to her? And so she was just able to keep it out. And that's the way that she survived Amazing. through everything that she survived. Well, and she did a good. better job keeping it out on her behalf yeah. than I did because the way they spoke about her, I remember that. The way the media, mm. cause, because she seems so stoic and a woman and a mother that's is right. not allowed to be stoic yeah, and the judgments yeah. and the conclusions that that's were right. reached. It's I think the power of the, so interesting. the power of the pause could have been done with then a lot. Yeah. Uh, we touched on the beginning of our conversation, Lisa, and it wasn't necessarily as much of your book as I, I I'm looking forward to your next book, this idea of <laughs> helicopter parenting and um, it's called lawnmower parenting now as well. Where you lawnmower clear, parenting. Lawnmower parenting apparently is where you clear the of the path ahead of all obstacles. You smooth it out. Yeah. So we have an example of it here. This is very anecdotal, but we literally occasionally have a parent phone up and question us about our our place of work and whether or not their child. We literally have parents wanting to interview us oh, on behalf, that. <gasps> on behalf of their family. And we just very politely say, you've just made it clear that your child can't work here because we're employing them. And if they're not responsible enough to handle this conversation, they are not responsible enough to work here. And we literally have parents justifying how we don't get to say that. We've literally now started getting this. I'm like, you are making your child unemployable. And I'm saying it, I am saying as clearly as that, Lisa, you are making your child unemployable if you think you need to smooth every obstacle out of their way. You are building a child who will not be capable of ever being told no, of ever being told you haven't met the standard, of ever being told that's not how we do things around here. Because all the glitches have been smoothed by these parents phoning us. Would you care to? <laughs> Where, Where do we go with that? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, yes. So I remember my son first hearing um, the term helicopter parenting and he was about 12. He said, what's that, mom? And I explained it to him. He thought about it. He said, huh. He said, you're more like a cargo plane. You come in, you drop supplies, and then you go. <laughs> My husband heard him and I, I'm thinking in my mind, gee, can't go play. He couldn't have said a nice sleek jet or something. Yeah, exactly. Couldn't have been <laughs> a like, jet. Don't you turn that into, a, into an insult. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, look, how much, 
you know, do we think about our own parenting when it comes to parenting yeah. our children? I think that's what's really interesting. And certainly, um, you know, if you read my story, Dad, my parents were certainly the sort of parents, if you showed interest in something like I did, mm -hmm. like my brother did in soccer, um, then they would get you there to wherever you wanted to go. But they weren't um, in so, um, you know, reliant on you um, being a, you know, being a superstar swimmer that um, they weren't supportive of you. So I always say, you know, and now you hear all of the stories of abuse in sport and yeah. um, even, you know, some at a pool. And, you know, I was a kid who um, mum and dad, no, dad would take me in the morning, you know, at four, quarter to four, quarter to five, we first started, um, when I first started morning training with Carlisle, but he'd sleep in the car or go for a run himself. Like wow. I never had parents that sat beside the pool and watched it. Yes. And you felt so sorry for the kid whose parent was sitting by the pool watching yes. it because, they were, um, they were usually when the parent left, they were the ones that were mucking up in the pool. So they didn't want to be there, yeah. you know? So, um, well, I wonder if I there's more, from I, yeah, I think there's more to it as well. It's the parent who needs, this is sweeping generalization, but I do see parents who need their children to succeed yeah. for whatever reason. But the story yeah, that, that was I was actually, the month before I was going the month, like in a couple of weeks before the Commonwealth games trials, like by then I'd come second at the, yeah. Now, open nationals and the 200 backstroke I'd broken state records all the time wow. so I was in a good position to try to make that to almost make that team but I was exhausted this one night in the pool and then I, um, I was still in tears I was in tears while I was trying to complete the set that my coach was asking me to do and I was in tears afterwards with dad I felt like I'd let my coach down I was just swimming terribly and I said I, this is not fun I don't want to I don't want to yeah. do this and um, he um, he took me home because I was about 15 minutes from the pool was 15 minutes from home. I walked up the stairs to go and have my dinner where mum had kept it warm. And he went back to the pool to tell coach that I wasn't, um, you know, mm. that I was retiring. Um, and so then he came back with a story that um, Peter, yes. my coach had told him about, about Mark Spitz. And apparently Mark Spitz had wanted to retire just before he, I think he, um, it was the hundred freestyle. He wasn't going to swim the hundred freestyle, I think at the Olympics, you know, before, because he might be beaten, whatever it was. It was some story where he'd almost walked away from the challenge yeah. and then he didn't. And um, and so dad told me this story. And of course, then he had his greatest breakthrough um, at, at that moment. And so dad told me the story, but it was still left up to me. So I slept yes. in and then I went back to the pool. And I think yeah. that's really important. But look, well, you've I think developed we give our You've developed intrinsic motivation, yes. whereas... Uh, a child who will only do it because the parents involved, that's extrinsic motivation. And every yeah. study shows the more extrinsically motivated we are, the less we're going to be able to sustain ourselves through the rocky roads that are inevitable in anything. Inevitable. But the yeah. story you give in Glide that I love is the time that the parent, I'm going to misquote you, so help me out here. Yeah, yeah. There was moments where parents didn't want their kids to be in tears. So you were in tears with fear and overwhelm or stress or exhaustion, but your parents left it to you. What do you want to do with that feeling? You have actually a story in here where parents literally said, how could you let your child cry? That yeah. anything to avoid having their child feel discomfort. And then you went further for some of these parents, it was not wanting to feel their own discomfort as their child cried. And this yeah. comes back to this stimulus response conversation child cries respond with shutting down the tears making it better making it right i think you're really so clued in here that pause okay is it okay for my child to cry right now is this a manageable pain is this a manageable discomfort is this given their developmental stage something they can work their own way through and sit with and then process and come through do they need my assistance not do they need it to be stopped yeah, and yeah. I think you spoke about that a little in the book later on. I thought that's such a good point. You know, when is it that we stop the tears or when do we make the discomfort go away? Yeah. How long can we manage our own discomfort for to yeah. allow the discomfort in another and still call it compassion? Mm, mm, mm. Because I, I was surprised at that response. I'd been yeah. telling, you know, as I said, the story about the DY ladies often in different, um, in different areas. And then it was only in the last few years, yeah, that I told a story about, you know, I think I was asked about motivating your kids and motivating teenagers. And that was the yeah. first time it happened. But then it happened a few times subsequently when I went and spoke at, you know, in front of uh, a different, you know, different yeah. groups where that response was, God, how could you, you know, how could your yeah. parents let you cry? I couldn't stand letting my child cry. And I was like, I took me from you know, totally yes. left, left field. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, I was, <laughs> yeah, I, of course. I mean, there were times when they, I had walked away. I, I didn't like physical culture. I didn't do it. So mum probably didn't, um, 
it wasn't that she was, I, I don't know, it, but yes, yeah, she certainly let me go. But the DY ladies wouldn't. I think that's the really interesting yes. thing that they understood what was going on because it happened all the time at the yeah. pool. They always saw kids. It's in okay that to feel uncomfortable. Yeah, and they knew how, they had a they had a way of getting through it. I think that's yeah. the important thing because, as you say. Yes. Like the beautiful, we, I mean, we talk about mindfulness. There's four foundations of mindfulness. And that second foundation is feeling tone, Vedana. It's yeah. a really powerful observation that, in fact, we, um, we move towards um, feel, you know, feelings of pleasant and we move away from what's unpleasant. And yeah. so when your child cries, of course, there's a feeling of unpleasantness in you because yeah. you don't like to see them in pain. Yeah. But, I, you know, I, I remember one time, Dex, it was in year seven, he'd gone to his um, high school by himself. The other boys had been tutored and went off to Sydney boys and, and he went to some, the more local high school and he'd got into the selective stream, but I didn't believe in tutoring. So he was by himself. And then he was struggling with friends. And mm. uh, so I was concerned because that had been yeah. me in year seven and with, with swimming and all that sort of yeah. stuff. And he said to me one day in the car, mum, sometimes I just want to be able to tell you something without you feeling the need to fix it. Yeah. And, yes. um, and that's, you know, we all fall into that trap, of yes. course, because we're, we're, we're caring people. Yeah. But we are in a situation now, I think, as you mentioned, children, you know, God, we're talking about consent consent surely is the ability just to say hear the word no mm. and be okay with it yeah or feel a feeling and be okay that that person okay. is having that's that what feeling that's, yeah but if we've got a whole lot of young people who don't know the word feel, haven't felt haven't heard the word no then in that moment when things are really you know are happening <laughs> that's which i'm not i'm not condoning oh, condone, but this no. is what we need to yeah. step back and take we need to practice no oh, in a whole lot of other situations that aren't yeah. so yeah. um you know uh acute if you like mm. um and i think that's something that we're not addressing and and um i've heard that w what you described i've heard that before where parents are calling you know employers to check can you imagine i remember speaking at a school once i was there to talk to my year 12 the year 12s about the sort of the creative writing piece they had to do and um, it was the first time that some of them, that some of them hadn't had their form signed by their parents to, you know, to say that they could come and hear me speak. So this is year 11s becoming year 12s. And they were stopping some, the school was stopping some of those students who hadn't had their form signed from coming to see me. And that was the first time they'd been held accountable for not getting something done. And the way that the, um, you know, the teacher sort of expressed it before I spoke was, um, well, what happens if you pulled over on the side of the road and your car hasn't been um, registered you can't say oh mum didn't do it can't yeah. tell what are you going to tell the policeman and so I told the story there that uh, my son was in year seven at, at the local um you know high school and he'd lost 40 percent on an assignment that he put in because he handed it in two days late and it was 20 percent yeah. each day yeah and the they were like but didn't the school call you and I was like well no it's not no. about me it's about no. <laughs> and he didn't do it again I can tell you that yes so, um, so that balance of um, being there, being supportive, but not um, stepping on too many toes and letting them discover things for themselves, I think it's incredible. Yes. And I, I was, we were really pleased um, when last year um, he decided that, um, or our son decided he was going to go to the ANU or apply to the ANU because he'd read a study said that the most unhappiest, the unhappiest cohort in the society is 18 to 24 year olds who are still living at home. And so he decided he would live out of home. Good on him. And, and, I'm just um, thinking about the repercussions of why that is. And that's a really, that's a good study to know. I can think of yeah, so many reasons. It, but, um, mm. yeah. Well, I think also we talk about initiation, don't we? And we talk about things we were allowed to do. Like, yeah. you know, there's that whole the hero's journey type thing, the Joseph Campbell stuff, where there's and a lot how of we're supposed, stuff through we're teenagers. supposed to progress. Yeah, you're supposed to grow we're supposed up. You're supposed to, to mature. Up. Yeah. And, you know, yes, I was at 16, I was a captain of an Olympic team and it was stressful, but talk about a way to be initiated into yes. growing up, into speaking up for yourself, into a whole lot of really good things. So as a, as a, as a, in terms of personal growth, it was an amazing thing, a situation yeah. to be, um, to be part of. And, and I, and at the same time, we we're also going out, we were going to bands, we were trying to get into the local pub, but like, you know, I know that it's not seen as the dumb thing to do, but at least we were, I think now, God, what about if kids were just distracted by the band playing? They might not actually be drinking quite as much, you know, you didn't, yeah. you didn't leave the spot to go and get a beer. Not that I was drinking because I was swimming for Australia, but we were crowded in, you wanted to hold <laughs> your spot, you were close to the band, you know, yeah. so. There were a whole lot of things we were allowed to do then. That we oh, exactly. And, and stranger things doing it. 
not stranger just danger they actually have laws in 14 states in the united states where it is illegal to have a free-range child which means a child catching public transport without an adult supervised is against the law it's uh, illegal as a teenager yeah yeah you literally can be arrested as a parent for neglect if you're and so in japan they have the opposite so as a they actually have entire systems of schooling where you're not allowed to bring your child to the school. They all have to use public transport. They can stick together, it's absolutely fine, but they're all expected to learn the independence. And then in the schools, they have to clean their own school. They have to prepare the meals, keep the toilets tidy. There's this sense of respect for the community space and how they operate within it. And then I go to the American extreme and more the Australian extreme where there is no expectancy around that at all. That would never be a narrative that would be created here without yeah. outrage about personal rights and violating my personal choice and freedom to express. And well, hang on, maybe there is a middle path here. Let's come back There's to mindful compassion. <laughs> there must be a middle path There's here. Middle where path. Something can be drawn from these two ideas instead of opposing and being adversarial drawing from each and landing in a space that's going to work for these children to know that their minds their hearts their feelings and their bodies can be united that they can yeah. be fully whole bodied in this moment and yeah. own this moment and then phone me up and ask for a job without putting their parents on the phone <laughs> <laughs> it, um, you know um, you would have the same not quite that but the same thing where people come to you and say oh, what can I do my kids are experiencing anxiety and you know blah 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 and I'll say come to my course come yes. and do MBSR yeah so I want the to parents do to, to do it <laughs> because once your nervous system is settled then yeah. that will help um your child and most exactly. of the time I don't have time I don't have time and they want their kid to be fixed. So that's the pattern. This isn't every parent. So if anyone's listening, thinking no, we talk about not. every parent, every child all the time, please don't not. make it that simple as no, what we're saying. Right. Yeah. Understand the nuance of what we're saying without it constantly having to be said. But whenever a child comes, a parent sends a child, we'll say it's the parent that needs the, the lesson because oh, yeah, the child is simply, ref, yeah, just yeah, the parent the needs bear, to turn up. I th and I think that we need to, you know, the, the our kids, um, the things that we're talking about in terms of our teenagers or even our, you know, the, the whole thing about the millennials, that's been learned. Mm. That has been learned from the society that they live in, from the yeah. parenting, from, from all of the um, inputs, if you like. Yeah. You don't just, uh, you know, wake up one day and have um, be a sort of person who thinks that mum needs to call an employer. Yeah. That, no. that has happened. That's and, learned. And, and we, you know, we, I heard a story the other day about, um, it was my my niece um, and has cousins that live in America who go to a school where there are children who identify as what's called furries. Yes. So they dot they get around on all fours. That's they right. I've never heard of this before. Yeah. And my immediate reaction is, oh my god, like what is going on there? What are the parents thinking? Blah blah blah, all this sort of stuff. And then I was sitting, you know, at a cafe, you know, a couple of days ago after I'd heard the story and there's one family with, you know, the kids sitting, eating their food while the kids are on an iPhone, iPad. So yep, not there it is. Anyone. And there's another, you know, group where the dog's sitting on the lap of the person who's eating at the cafe and you're thinking, well, maybe it's a really um, help, normal response to what these kids are seeing that in fact, the dog gets a lot of attention and a lot yes. of care. Yep. And the kids are not. So it's really interesting what we, I think, as, as and I think that we raise, a, you know, a village raises the child. It's not just the parents. Yeah, yeah, but of I course. think it's a conversation that, oh, it's so interesting just that um, the things that, you know, our parents just would think is so strange um, and yet now has become, become normal. Uh, just, you know, sitting by the side of the pool, if you like. Then, you yes, know, and I think it needs to be not. a... I think it needs to be okay to question this. Like there's going to be people listening now about the comments about fairies saying, don't you judge, everyone's allowed to fret. Well, hang on, I am allowed to question it. And we need to keep having conversations and create a culture where our questioning it is as, as permitted as someone doing it. That well, I think it's also important. I think I told the story. I was judging it at first. And then yes. you go back and you say, hold on a minute, can I see this in another way? And yeah. right beside me, there's another perspective. Yes. So I think the capacity, as you say, for... Yes, we immediate, it, it is absolutely human. I mean, John Cabot's in, you know, we talk about the, the um, you know, we're concentrating on the breath, our mind goes off the breath, and yeah. then we notice that and come back to it, but we come back to it non judgmentally. Yeah. Now, that means that 
we can't be well when we start to watch our minds we're full of judgment yes but it's the capacity to hold the judgment and go that's interesting that I have judged it in that way yeah can I find another way to look at it as you say to be uh, we there is a natural reactivity can we notice the reactivity not judge it and then go ah how interesting can I see this in another perspective and that's the skill and as you say that capacity to sit with somebody who is diametrically opposed in terms of politics or what they believe and yet still find common you know yep. common humanity that's so mm. important but it's being lost and like mm, you practice I, agree. I think what we practice it's about bringing people together even though we may have diametrically opposed views it's still going to be interesting and say yeah wow mm. that's interesting i hadn't thought of it from that perspective yep. one of the things i think about judgment is i normalize it um, people come to us to train to be coaches saying oh but i'm too judgmental of course you are our instinctive are. part <laughs> of our brain needs to make fast judgments to know that it can survive this moment and get through it and maybe hopefully belong as well. That's what our instinctive brain is aiming for after thousands and thousands of years of conditioning. That judgment, that immediate judgment is designed for our survival and for us thriving in a community where basically breeding is survival. So given that's natural, that pause becomes even more important. So the judgment's gonna be there. Well, hang on, let's not act on that. Let's know that that's in me no matter what. And then let's do the second and the third and the fourth response and see what else is available after the fast judgment, because that fast judgment is going to beat logic every day. How we've survived. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And we did a great job. You know, if we're sitting here, our ancestors survived everything they survived. You and I, our parents, 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 going back tens of thousands of Mm. millennia Mm. survived Mm. literally tigers. Mm. We talk about how we feel the flight fight response because of an imaginary tiger. They actually did survive that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it has to be so tightly wound up in us to feel survival instinct. If yeah. you're living today, you are the most prone to survive because that instinct in your ancestors is the most, most developed. Those yeah, whose survival yeah. instinct was not that well developed didn't survive and not sitting here today so of course we're going to feel instinctively negative or worried or anxious or stressed or and then it becomes beautiful mindfulness that you teach well how can we counteract it not get rid of it how can we balance it out and notice we are so much more than that yeah and i think that's where mindfulness you know does receive it 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 doesn't have a great rap in that sense it's all about relaxing it's all about getting rid of stress or getting rid of thoughts and it isn't what the beauty of mindfulness is as just the awareness and the compassion of what is arising yes compassion for ourselves as human beings as you know imperfectly perfect humans um but with the capacity still to act uh, or respond in the best wisest way for all of us you know um that is the that's the I think that's why it's such a great skill and should I wish it was taught in schools. <laughs> I, think, I think it is with it you, is, isn't it? Is, it? Is, it is. Yeah, it so is tell, tell us about schools, the yeah. work you do. How share us a little oh, bit about what I you do. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't I mean I guess more I speak um I, I teach tend to teach people out of school now more than yeah. in school. I think um, you know, places like Smiling Mind and or oh, um Smiling Mind and, and you know, and our headspace, you know, they're doing great stuff in school. And I think they've got the capacity to yeah. um, to actually um, do it on scale. But yeah, just that, um, oh, look, I think like you, you know, you, the beauty of being able to help, you know, a university student who's absolutely at their wits end, they've got one assignment after the other, it's just, you know, coming at them and they just don't feel as though they can manage and that they're mm-hmm. getting themselves into a panic. And that capacity, that ability to help them hold what's going on and realize, oh, it's just a feeling. It's yeah. just a story that I'm telling. I can actually just sit, I can breathe my way through it. I've got, or I've got, you know, a skill. I can walk, get up, go for a walk, see the sunshine, feel it on my skin, um, take a deep breath. Oh, okay. Now I see a way through the assignment. I can see what I couldn't see before and then come back to it in a much calmer place. Mm. And, um, and we see it all the time. You see it in the clients that you, you must coach that I see it in the people that I, that I teach or that I, you know, that essentially I'm on the path. So we're teaching one another in many ways because like, we learn as much from the people that we work sure. with. Um, and, and I think that um, it's, uh, it's so nice. It's just so needed right now. It is. I agree. Yeah, and I also yeah. want to turn off social media. I want to teach mindfulness of compassion, not on social media. So <laughs> well, I'll tell you what you... turned me off social media last year. Is, um, I've got it right here. And it, 
it was very interesting when I went to live in New York I studied acting right and that was my first kind you did. of um, think oh I'll I've got to work out what's going on I'm somehow disconnected from my body it was yeah. very interesting when I started and, yeah. and but um but the beauty of it was that you know back in 1990 it's New York was a self-help capital of the world. We didn't have it here, of course, but there. Right. But I couldn't get through a whole book. I'd think I'd much rather read fiction, you know. Or th yes. That's what storytellers are about. They're about showing human behaviour and you yeah. walk in someone else's shoes, you know, the old Atticus Finch thing. And so then when this came out, I don't know if you've ever if you read it, The Living sure. Sea of Waking Dreams I by um, Richard Flanagan. Uh, so it came out, oh, I don't know, maybe October last year. And, um, oh, the disconnection in this book it's unputdownable and yet it's just wow thank you so incredibly um, powerful okay. and I think fiction has a wonderful power a wonderful way of doing that that you're just like I, I I'm supposed to be on social media to promote my book and everything but I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to be <laughs> that that was so interesting the the just the pain that those people were in it was it's a bit of magic realism so you have to go yep. with the idea that a woman is losing parts of herself and then her son is disappearing in front of her and and then the disconnection, of course, with bias, with the with um, with nature, it's really wonderful. It's Thank powerful you. help to disconnecting from social media if you're looking for it. <laughs> I love reading. I I really have no trouble. I recommend this book, Glide by Thank you. Uh, Glide, taking the panic out of modern living by you. I have no trouble <laughs> finishing whole books. I want to know the narrative, the hero story arc. I'm I really respect what it takes to craft a book because it's all those tumbling thoughts and experiences you've mm. got to create into a narrative i think that's a it's a wonderful thing so i i am who i am today because of the journeys people have had prior to me yeah and they yeah. were they were uh, gave me the privilege of accessing their experiences i know i am who i am today because i was able to draw on the yeah. books i've read the experiences that others have had that have contributed to the choices i can make in that pause if i yeah, could i think still enough I think that uh, like it was the same thing. It was that it, uh, not the same thing. So it was more, it was my ability to actually shift into uh, into that self help space. I don't think I was ready to yes. say I was. I, you know, I think particularly also at that time you were reading stuff that you know it's your mother's fault that you are the way you are, and it was that yep. sort of stuff. Like I'm not. I don't want to blame somebody else. Yep. Yep. I don't know if yep. it was that era of of self help stuff. That um, whereas now I understand now what they're saying is okay. We've been conditioned. Yes. And so it doesn't. Yep. We, we can forgive, you know, our, everybody um, has parents that are imperfect. So yeah. we can forgive them because they were doing the best with what they had. And we are now doing the best with what we have, but we can take responsibility for what's arising in our stuff. So exactly. that was my response to that. But certainly fiction, I never had trouble finishing at all. <laughs> <laughs> but at that time, I was also wanting to write a book. So I hadn't quite Yeah, congratulations. That and we haven't mentioned that to our viewers. You've written five books. So yeah, it, exactly. yeah, that's just phenomenal. Now, Lisa, is there anything you feel we haven't covered that we you'd like to talk about? Um, I don't. Uh, I think generally, um, well, is there anything? I guess the one thing that I would say is that the trouble with my thinking got in the way of joy, got yeah. in the way of me enjoying what I love to do. I've been so fortunate in my life that I started yeah. with swimming. I found swimming. I loved it. And then the journalist that I was traveling with said, you should be a sports reporter because I was always writing. So yeah. I love to write. I love to interview people. I love to write books. I love to, you know, go to acting school, live in New York. I've always done things that I really love to do. Mm. I've never really worked in that sense that I haven't enjoyed yeah. my job. But it's so it's more the, the, the thinking or the trouble with my thinking got in the way of my joy. And mm. so what we can talk about you know goals you know doing achieving and all that sort of stuff like in the in the end i think that we're here to have a beautiful time or have the best time we can have with what's going on if we can be aware there's going to be stress we can't take it out of our life no. and also there's good stress you know there is stress of a challenge that we want something that we'd like to achieve but um if we are the more aware we are the more present we are the more we can catch joy and beauty mm. on the run and I yes. think that's what, for me, what these practices have given me. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Where can people discover more about you, Lisa, and the work that you're doing? Uh, um, you can go to my website, evermind.com.au. Make sure you put the AU on or you'll go to a nursing home in New York or somewhere like okay. <laughs> So evermind.com.au or lisa at evermind if, uh, uh, if you'd like to, um, .com.au if you'd like to inquire about, you know, upcoming courses or about... Um, 
private coaching. Yeah. Um, and yeah, um, and my book is um, available in, in Glide, I should say, is available in you know, good bookshops and or at Booktopia, of course. You can get it on booktopia.com.au um, as well. Thank you. They've but got a pile of those on. books at my bookstore. Uh, great. Well, yeah, hopefully they're book. selling. They had a pile. It was fantastic. I was so pleased for you. Oh, That's how you. I found it. I just thought it was fantastic. Good on you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, congratulations. It was really, you know, it was really, yeah. I mean, I think when you discover something like this, it's like coaching, like, oh, there's a way through this. We don't have to be having a bad time. <laughs> yes. We can actually free ourselves from those things that are causing us stress. A yes. lot of the stuff, a lot yeah, of it's okay. inside. And the more you can free yourself from that, then the happier your life is. Yeah. Beautiful final words. Thank you, Lisa. Really you. appreciate you. Our oh, pleasure. Pleasure was mine. Thank you.